We must be cautious. Welcome to the Nerd Party. Hi, this is Nick Anastasiu, story editor on Star Wars The Clone Wars and Star Wars Bad Batch. And you are listening to Aggressive Negotiations. Well, hello and welcome to Aggressive Negotiations, that little slice of Star Wars that you just can't get enough of. And I am just one of the hosts here, Jedi Master Matthew Rushing, and with me, as he is every single week, the oh, wearing our own merchandise as in, quote unquote, an in-universe Star Wars t-shirt, Jedi Master John Mills. Well, it's all about branding, really, in Star Wars. As we all know, mm, that Star Wars Cola is uh, consumed by several of the characters, and they frequently look at the screen mm-hmm. and wink. At least I've been told the characters <laughs> look at the screen and wink. That's the same as looking just off camera, apparently. But, exactly. uh, you know, outside of that really deep cut reference for people who will have had to have listened to a show that I shuddered many years ago, I am pleased to be here, Jedi Master Rushing, and I'm actually excited because of what we're going to be discussing today. I am too. Uh, We are going to be going through uh, the second season of The Bad Batch. Of course, we just had the trailer drop as we're recording this for season three, which both John and I are very excited about that final season of The Bad Batch. Before we dive into that, of course, wherever you're listening, please subscribe and that way you'll get our show as soon as it drops of course you can also find us on social media we would love it if you'd follow us over there on whatever they're calling twitter these days at the jedi masters we've got the entire network you can follow at join nerd party you can also find us on facebook at facebook.com slash the nerd party we are online at the nerd party.com we're on instagram at the nerd party and it's the perfect way to be able to share the show, too. Uh, word of mouth is a great way for a podcast to grow. And, you know, there's a lot of Star Wars podcasts out there. But if you enjoy us, let people know it by uh, saying, hey, listen to Aggressive Negotiations. But, uh, John, the first episode of Season 2 of The Bad Batch is called Spoils of War. And, you know, one of the things that I was really struck by in this episode was how tight the storytelling is, as, as it almost always is in, in Star Wars animation, but specifically here, uh, the way in which everything that they're doing is building the fact that, you know, this is the second season, some time has passed, Omega's grown a little bit, um, but every single part of this episode, it's like nothing is wasted, You know, there's Mm -hmm. nothing about it that's not building towards things that are going to play out later in this episode. And then, of course, throughout the rest of the season, really. And so really was just love rewatching this because you can see all the little places where they're kind of building in these moments that are going to build throughout the entire season. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. I almost use the word effortless, and that's untrue. I'm sure it is full of effort, but it they make it look it, to borrow a phrase, quote unquote, they make it look easy. And what I mean by that is, you're right. Coming back and looking at it, there were moments that I appreciated more on a rewatch, specifically because I saw I know where it's going to go. Sure. And so, what seemed in this first episode. Um, with the brand new character voiced by Wanda Sykes flirting with tech, Mm -hmm. thinking that's just a brash underworld type trying to throw him off of his game, saying, oh, this is not a wasted moment. This is not just fluff that's thrown in. This has purpose for the season. And even the way it opens, as all great Star Wars does in Media Race, we don't see the precipitating event for the giant crab monsters to be chasing them. Because all we need to know is relayed to us while they're running away. Wrecker did something wrong. Although, you know, I'll defend him here. It seems like he he did it just, just right. But you find out that Omega's been studying since we saw her last. Because she's sitting there studying. But like any kid, she wishes she wasn't studying. She wants to have fun. We even have that callback to the opening of Ra- Raiders of the Lost Ark. When Jock is uh, fishing. Yep. And she's sitting there at the ship that they're running toward with the natives attacking them and the fishing line in the water. Like it's it's such a a a clever way to go. And I think to get to where you're going with it as well, 
is the decision to go back to Sereno is so smart because for those of us who are longstanding Clone Wars fans, as all people should be, it's, oh, good, I get to go back to this place. I'm excited. But the way that it's done, it functions, and you know I'm a big stickler for this, and I want to get your thoughts on it. I feel it functions exactly the way a sequel story should, where you don't have to have seen a single thing. You know why Sereno is important, and you know their situation from the the, the setup dialogue, and that's it. That's all like that's that's all you need. Like if you know who Count Dooku is and you can just have watched the prequels and come right into this episode and you go, Oh yeah, Count Dooku, I know who that is. And if it's your first time here, you're like, Oh, cool, they're going to Sereno. So like it works in that layered fashion. Do you agree that it works in that layered fashion or do you think it's a reference too far? No, no, I think it works uh, in that layered fashion and mainly, too, because like they let you know, you know, what Sereno is just in case, you know, you haven't seen the Clone Wars. You know, it's it was mm-hmm. Count Dooku's planet. Uh, it, this is his castle. Um, this is uh, and they let you know who he was and the fact that he was a Jedi that turned against the, the Jedi and the Republic and read the Separatists, you know, like everything you need is there. Um, and so, and of course, you know, longtime fans, it's like, yes, we're going back to this place and, you know, we kind of see almost, you know, somewhat the hypocrisy of, of the character who, you know, has amassed these riches, you know, and didn't really, you know, didn't really care about the galaxy. It seems like, you know, it was really just all about him, which is kind of a classic Sith thing, right? It, it's really about what you're getting out of the deal. So I think it even builds into the Dooku story long after his death at this point. And so I think that's all great. You know, and, and like you said, I, I think really the beauty here too is, you know, yes, Omega is studying here and that study is actually going to play into the rest of this episode, you know, and and give them an opportunity to be able to escape because she remembers something from her studies that, you know, the clones... Because, you know, they haven't been reading the tech manuals in a long time. Uh, They wouldn't necessarily have readily available in their mind, you know. So there are all of these little bits and pieces that I think um, are are growing. I mean, uh, even here, the the double entendre even of of what Sid says, right, I think is, is, is excellent in the sense that, you know, she talks about then you haven't been paying attention. And she mentions the Empire, right? But... There's this undercurrent, too, of this control that she believes she has over the clones. And, of course, Mm. that plays into the rest of this season, right? Um, But even that, you know, there's even a third layer to that because then there's the whole discussion there with Hunter and um, Echo about the fact that they could be doing more. That, that they shouldn't mm-hmm. just be hiding, that they should use this treasure for the greater good of, you know, trying to free the galaxy from the Empire's clutches. And, you know, so I, what's what's crazy about rewatching this very short episode here is the way in which it is building for the entire season and this episode. And I think it's just really special because it shows how good the writers are, how good the creators are of this show, and they know exactly what they're doing in building this um, this first episode. But I think, too, the fact that this episode doesn't resolve itself in the first, you know, um, 22 minutes also lets you know that things are getting worse. Um, it's a, it's a yeah. great realization that, yeah, uh, you know, the the other season, the last season, yeah, things mostly got resolved in, in one episode. Not anymore. You know, the the rest of the season, it's going to feel like there's a lot more connections to, to episodes. And a, and a lot of things are just not going to be as easy for these guys as it used to be. Well, I think there's um, there is a confidence, I think, just in this first episode where I think that the creative team – really expresses they know they got it done in season one. And th- this is, this is, this very much has the feeling of, you know, I, I don't want to get too effusive uh, in, in the praise sort of thing, but it, it's, it's the feeling of a, a, like a, an NFL team that went to the playoffs the previous season. 
and the staff is pretty much the same and the te- the players are all the same and they come back and they have that first game and it's like yep this is you know they they have lack of a better term there's a little bit of swagger in the sense that they have the confidence to the to end the episode the way that they do they have the confidence to trust that everything that they're setting up leads to the moment where when that container is falling and the screen goes out at the end of 22 minutes my reaction is no 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 i need the next episode like on this rewatch i'm i'm being very disciplined and saying i'm not going to jump straight into the next episode it was very difficult because it does exactly what a serial is supposed to do which is leave me on a cliffhanger and say well what wait no what's going to happen next and there's a focus i i think what we're getting at here is there's a focus to the episode of the same way that I, I I don't think it hit till about season three in the Clone Wars, this sense of the sense of focus that we're getting here, where right from the gate, there is such an efficiency to the storytelling that, yeah, I, I mean, we keep coming back to it. There's not a single wasted moment here. There's not a moment where I say, oh, that was a great episode, but, you know, I didn't really care for that. Like everything with everything seemed to be the right length the right amount of time. And even the conversation between Echo and Hunter didn't belabor itself. It set up everything. Hey, we should be doing more. Hey, uh, she deserves a better life than this. Hey, what exactly is it we're doing with our lives? And so we know already the whole season is going to be focused on those three things from one conversation in a 22 minute episode. And frankly, let's set aside what was a big hit. What wasn't a big hit with us in terms of the live action it's something where once again, I look at this episode and I say, why, why is live action strugg- seeming to be struggling with this sometimes? To get, like, I got so much in 22 minutes here. Why is it that sometimes I'm watching like a 45 minute episode of live action and I'm saying, I'm like, well, what really happened? You know, like I, I'm like tuning out. I might be looking at my phone, but this I'm there the whole time. So sorry to ramble. But that's no, that's just no, where I'm at. because it, I was just I was taking in what you're saying, and and I think you know it's one of those things. That obviously, I think everybody knows that I'm going to agree with everything you just said um, because we're on the same page in that. Um, but I, I think one of the things that you know this does is that uh, the beauty of 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 where we are here with the Bad Batch is the way in which it's also creating synergy with other things that that you know star wars is doing um and you know this pairs so well with andor right in the sense that this is the beginning of the empire and Mm. andor then and and everything we're doing here is then really even building into what you're going to see in that, right? It, it builds into uh, the world you see in Solo and Rogue One, of course. And so, uh, and then, of course, it it, it helps build uh, and, and further explain the universe that you are in when you get to A New Hope, you know? And so I, I think that's one of the things here is, you know, animation in so many ways has become the the way to to bind things together. Animation is almost like the force of the Star Wars galaxy in in that way. And and I think I love the way you put that. I, I was just, you know, when I was saying it, I was like, oh, that that's just, that's exactly what Obi Wan says, you know, about the the force and everything. And so it's like, but I think that there's such a it's so intentional, right? Like you're talking about the intentionality here of the episode and what they're doing and how it's playing together and how it's all working together. Um, but then when I think about this in the larger context, I think that's what makes it so great is because I enjoy the Bad Batch for what it is. But then as a larger fan of all of Star Wars, I get to enjoy it in the way in which it informs all of these other areas that I enjoy, especially with what comes next. And when you're when you're ever you're adding it to a, a universe, you always want to make sure that the thing that you're you're adding to it with does give you a new perspective on the rest of things. You know, give you mm-hmm. a, a, a 
from a certain point of view, you can see things differently because now you have this new point of view that you've just been given. It, it's like writing a good Star Wars book, right? Mm-hmm. Both of us, I think, would agree the best Star Wars books make us uh, look at the overall saga and different parts of that saga in new and fresh and different ways. And they then make you excited to go back and rewatch those things. And I think that's the thing that I'm I'm finding and in, in thinking about with this episode is just that mm-hmm. – I love how this is making me think, oh, I kind of want to do an Andor rewatch as well. You know, I kind of want to go back now and um, I'm I'm actually interested in diving into the original trilogy again, you know, and and, and digging into to Star Wars as we go through this. And so there's just – I think that's what makes this, you know – where we enjoy um, the animation, I think it's because in so many ways, you know, that's what animation at its best in Star Wars does. Well, speaking of at its best, there are two things there. One of them being, I think that the cinematic nature of not just the editing, but the way that the shots are chosen. Great point. This, This is something where... I think you and I have agreed that with the volume, things struggle sometimes because, in a sense, the volume has to operate like animation, but it isn't animation. So it, it there's this odd restriction that, like, yeah. it, choosing choosing live camera focus poles and and shots like I, I think there's one shot and there are a lot of shots in this that I think are great but like even looking at one moment when Hunter and Wrecker you know land on the top of the castle and Hunter looks up at the cargo ship going and he's you know in the foreground a little out of focus and you see the cargo ship up there and it looks exactly the way you would see like a live action composition that frees up animation and makes it feel more real. Whereas it almost seems like there's this inversion with the live action stuff sometimes, not all the time, sometimes, where the planning necessary for that shot to happen with the fake background, it's like the live action people aren't, it's not processing in their brains the same way. It feels like a limitation as opposed to something that frees them. Right. But then, but well, then the other thing, and I think this is incredibly subtle, is even with the changes in costume and everything, I think one of the, the reasons that you or even me looks at it and says, oh, this feels a little bit more like Andor, a little bit more like Solo, a little bit more like A New Hope, is the color palette shifts a little bit. The filters shift a little bit. And it, I think it makes a difference because even just with the way the colors come across, it it conveys a um it conveys a sense of mood and 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 spirit that that really sets you up for for what you're going to get but you were trying to say something i'm sorry no, i no 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 because what? it was just you you spark something in my brain it's like you know uh, one of the things uh, about the volume right is that um everything has to be perfectly lined up so that everything works in camera and the moment you move the camera, everything then has to shift again so that all of the compositing on the screens looks correct and gives you the right depth perception, right? But the beauty of, of the, the animated world is it it's more like live action in the sense that everything's real, quote unquote, inside the computer. So mm-hmm. you can find the best angles you're getting. And, and yes, they're using the same type of angles – that you would use if you were using real camera work. They're not they're not cheating, right? That that's mm-hmm. one of the things that's made Star Wars animation so great, right? Is that they've used the same type of camera angles that, you know, uh George would have used uh throughout the, in, the entire saga that he directed. And yeah. so therefore you're 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 getting that sense that you're almost in a live action type of shot. That whereas there is no play on the volume because everything has to hit that mark and there's no movement in the sense of like you you can't – again, referencing Andor, right? They built the whole town there 
And so the actors could go whatever way they wanted and the camera would just follow them like real people would do. And so that's the beauty of animation because that's that's the feeling you get, right? Because it, it, it has that reality because in that world, everything is real. You know, the, uh, some, something you said is it, Lucas cheated a little bit once he he got it's true. <laughs> he got it's access true. to the cameras, and yeah. so I think the reason that that you keep going to Andor and I mentally keep going to A New Hope is because even though animation can cheat that way, the choice is being made here to have the same visual language in a large sense that was there in the original trilogy. Which is appropriate because as we're approaching that time period, it's like the decision in Rebels to make the Sabres look more 1977 than what they can do now. Like the Sabres now look, you know, like they actually exist. Whereas then, you know, it's it's the glowing rod with the, you know, the rotoscoping and stuff like that, right? Um so I think that's that that's definitely something where the visual language uh, w- works so well. But I know that the production on this had its had some challenges with the voice work because they had to do a lot more remote work for this. What I find amazing, and I think this is a huge tip of the hat to everybody that was, uh, you know, behind the scenes. Or, you know, isn't isn't, you know, in the starring credits sort of thing is that there are live action productions that happened during the restrictions where you could tell Obi-Wan, for instance, the Obi-Wan Kenobi series. Oh, yes, The sets yeah. aren't as populated yep. as we want them to be. We could tell that there the restrictions had an effect. Maybe this is something that animation benefited from, but there's no no difference in performance or anything like that. And I know it's, you know, oh, well, you know, visually they can do that. But voice acting would have been so easy for, for that to be a little bit different. It would have been so easy for the direction, for the editing, for all of those things to be a little bit off. But instead it seems to have tightened, right? It seems to have like really brought, um, you know, like it's almost as if some of the remote challenges made this team, even better like is that weird am i am i off base on that no i don't think you're off base on that i think the the blessing for them is that you know so much of this show is done by d bradley baker right yeah that's true so him playing those characters is him playing off himself right and and remembering what he did in that last take when you know he was wrecker and now he's a hunter and everything um, and so I think, I think they're blessed in that sense. Uh, yeah. and, and therefore, and, and, and two, I think the other beauty in this is that, you know, I know that especially with the clone wars and, and, and rebels and stuff, they would do those cast recordings together. They would try to be in the room, but one of the beauties of, of voice over work is that they are used to being in the studio by themselves and then having the director give them the direction and the director getting exactly what they want for the scene. And, um, and I, and so I think there's that, that's the key, but really I I think, you know, you can't say enough of just how good D Bradley Baker is as these characters so that it feels so effortless. Um, and I think everybody else then is, is really at the top of their game. And you, you know, I never feel there being a difference in the performances whatsoever, even though they were probably having to be, you know, outside or, uh, you know, with themselves more often. What I think is also a, a very big tribute to the, you know, the, 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 the staff that puts everything together, the direction, uh, all of that sort of thing is Wanda Sykes is not somebody that I would have said, oh, yeah, that's that's a voice talent I would bring in. I, I'm taking nothing away from Wanda Sykes' career. I've always enjoyed her. I think she's funny. She's been a great comedic actress. Um, her stint on uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm was wonderful. Um, all of that sort of stuff. I didn't, but I would not have sat there and said, oh, yeah, bring her in. Like, the same way I wouldn't have said that with Rhea Perlman. 
it wouldn't have occurred to me. So, you know, I, I think the real tip of the hat has to be to her, but also to the people that recognized she would work in this situation. It's incredibly difficult. I agree with you. I mean, when you think about it, there's a significant stretch of this show where it is literally just D. Bradley Baker talking to himself. But it feels like every distinct character talking, whether it's a clone commander, Wrecker, Hunter, Echo, uh, Tech. Everybody feels different, but it's literally just one guy being given a script and be like, hey, D, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, if you got a couple hours, we gotta, we gotta knock this out. And he's like, yep, I got you. Uh, you know, but, um, you know, I, 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 even though it's a very small piece of the episode here, Wanda Sykes, the, the vocal work, it's effective. Like, I, I don't, I don't hear it and go, eh, stunt casting. I don't want to hear this character again. It's, oh, I like this character. I like what, what's happening here. Uh, did you have a positive reaction to Wanda Sykes too? Yeah, I think uh, the the thing about her is that you know she has it, it's like Rio Perlman in some ways. She has a fun voice, you know, that mm. kind of gives the character life. And I think one of the things you know when you're casting somebody who maybe has a more recognizable name is you want them to have a voice that kind of gives you a sense of who that character is right away. And I I like that she's mysterious. She's a little bit mischievous sounding in this episode, and we're not quite sure what to make of her yet. And and mm-hmm. that's a great thing. Um, you know, I think one of the the questions that I love about the episode and what it leaves me at with is the question, okay, is this this person who's a friend of Sid's and Sid, who I'm getting some not so great vibes off of, is she going to turn out to be a foil in a bad way for the Bad Batch? Or will she just be a one off? Or will she turn out to be somebody who's going to be helpful for them? And mm-hmm. I love that in the performance here. I don't know yet. And yeah. it leaves me intrigued, though. So. No, I thought that, you know, she was a a great addition. I think another beautiful thing about this episode, too, you know, just what we see here with um, our our Clone Force 99 is their reluctance to, you know, use force against the clones. Thank you. Yes. Mm hmm. Yep. I I, I love that the, the stun blasts are in play, that they are like the clones that are in the service of the Empire, are trying to kill them. But they still cannot bring themselves to hurt their brothers, specifically because they can't hold them accountable for it. They understand. They're like, these guys are just doing their duty. And it, yes, I, like, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, up to and including, like it's such a wonderful gag that the first person they stun when he goes limp, like his head is inside the container, yeah. but like you see the rest, it's a beautiful moment because that's natural comedy. It's not forced. It's not an over the top sort of thing. And then you even have the comic thing, uh, you know, following up with it where, you know, Wrecker's like, what? I did it quiet. Like there's a Han Solo quality to him where he's like, what? Uh, it's quiet. I'll do it real quiet. Like, you know, and, and everybody else is like, no, but, you understand you've actually just made life worse for us, right? You get that, right? Uh, you, like it's, it's, it, it's a natural comedic moment though, which I think again, gets back to what we started the whole conversation with about the efficiency and the focus of the storytelling that it's not a forced comic moment. There are so many movies, including, and I'm not going to reprosecute anything here, but including a couple of more recent Star Wars movies where there are forced comic moments. And it's just like, they're groaners. It's like, eh, you know, you try, like, you grafted that on. Whereas the humor in this, from that stun blast moment, from, uh, you know, Wrecker as they're running away in the beginning, being like, what, I got it. You know, like, it, it, 
there there's a legitimate comedy to it that yeah. endears these characters to you. No, I I mean it's it's funny because you know as you were saying, you know you're not cheating, you know you're not moving forward. Uh you're, you know you're we're going to be watching this uh you know one episode at a time. I'm I'm doing the same thing and I was almost tempted, you know, to to let the the Disney Plus let me go to the next episode. And so um but you know I think also watching this, well, the one thing, uh, you know, they just brought out The Mandalorian Seasons 1 and 2 on 4K. Yeah. And it makes me hope that we are going to get the final season of The Clone Wars in 4K. We're going to get the Please. seasons of The Batch, Bad Batch in 4K. In fact, Please. if you're smart, what you do is, you know, Season 3 is about to come out. And by the end of this year, maybe around Christmas, uh, you're you're smart. And you put out a big old bad batch box set of all three seasons uh and, and behind the scenes interviews exactly give me those behind the scenes just, interviews yeah. so you do you do that and uh it's going to be on every star wars uh, fans christmas list and so but i mean this is this is a great start to the season but i think one of the things that you mentioned and i kind of love is that when they go back to ord mandel there is like a moodiness there mm-hmm uh, that you can just it's it's almost palpable right and i think it lets us know that this season we're kind of in for basically the empire strikes back season of the bad batch and mm -hmm. I, I like that um i like the subtlety of it and i can't wait to continue you know watching through the show um you know as we're going you know we're gonna hit of course uh um, the third season and we'll be continuing this se the you know, the second season a little bit into that, but, you know, we hope you enjoy us talking through the episodes as we get ready. And, uh, John, you know, if people want it to catch up with you, of course, see what else you've got going on, maybe talk about excitement for, uh, Bad Batch season three, where would they find you? Well, you can, uh, send me messages online to help my wife, uh, be okay with the idea that I want to get a 99 in the Clone Force 99 style tattoo. Um, she's not a fan of tattoos. I have two. She's sort of drawn the line. Help me out, folks. Help me out. Convince her I need that 99 like Wrecker has on his helmet, please. Uh, you can find me online as Kessel Junkie, and you can also find me right here on the network, co-hosting a show called House Lights, where we talk about uh, different movies. <laughs> well, a podcast about movies. Who... Who figured? And I co-host that Wait, with is that uh, the Tristan. Only, that, that, that's you know we're novel. blazing new yeah, yeah. We're, we're blazing new ground with that you know like we're we're going out we're doing something novel. Um, <laughs> we think the time is right to talk about movies uh, on podcasts. Honestly, that's that's really you know we knew there was a market for it and it just was untapped. Uh, <laughs> but I do that with Tristan Rattel and Darren Moser, um, and you can also find me occasionally uh, sitting in the, uh, the you know it's either the uh, the Norm Stool or the Jim J Bullock Square over on the 602 Club on the TFM network, which uh, you know I, I know is one of the 453,000 podcasts that you're on, Mr. Matthew Rushing, Jedi Master Matthew yes, Rushing. Yes, yes, uh, and, and I hope people will check that out. We always have a blast over there, and uh, it's it's been a lot of fun. In fact, we uh, started off the year together. Uh, They're talking about Zack Snyder's uh, Rebel Moon, so that was a blast. Uh, you can, of course, find me all over social media under the name Matt Rushing02 um, when I'm not here on the Nerd Party Network doing aggressive negotiations. You can find me doing Owl Posts with Dre Kaufman as we're talking through and talked through every single chapter of the Harry Potter series. Over on the TFM Network, doing a bunch of other shows as well. Literary Treks, The Orb, Warp 5, Saddle Up, and The Artificial Tango. But, John, you know, I am starting to hear um, some rumblings that uh, they are giving away uh, free lightsaber crystals at the Jedi Temple. So I think it's time to close these negotiations. Oh, my gosh. I want to get... what. Whatever crazy colors aren't canon anymore, I want to get them. I want to get them while they're giving them away. So, Master Rushing, these negotiations are closed. Join the revolution. Join the nerd party. <laughs>